Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. As a semi-truck driver, I've logged countless miles on the highways of Montana, from the rolling grasslands of the eastern plains to the towering peaks of the western mountains. I've seen it all, but there's something about the winding roads and rugged terrain of the Montana Rockies that always keeps me coming back. Maybe it's the sense of adventure that comes with tackling the steep inclines and sharp turns. Or maybe it's the feeling of being a small part of something much bigger than myself. Whatever it is, I can't deny that there's something special about driving a semi-truck through the mountains of Montana. The views are breathtaking. The air is fresh and clean. And there's always a sense of excitement and possibility around every bend. But it's not just the scenery that makes truck driving in Montana so special. It's also the sense of community and camaraderie among the truckers who share the roads. We're a tight-knit group, always looking out for each other, whether it's warning about road conditions ahead or lending a hand in case of a breakdown. And when we pull into a truck stop for a break, there's always a friendly face and a warm welcome. Even though we're all competing for the same loads and delivery times, there's a sense of mutual respect and understanding. We all know that we're in this together, and that makes for a pretty special experience. And of course, the challenge and sense of accomplishment of driving a semi-truck through the mountains of Montana is something that I will always cherish. I had been driving since early morning, and my semi-truck was already beginning to grow heavy from the long journey through Montana's majestic mountains. The sun was starting to set, and I knew it wouldn't be much longer until I reached my destination. Suddenly, a strong gust of wind slammed my semi-truck, almost knocking me off course. A clap of thunder echoed in the distance, and the sky began to darken. Within minutes, heavy rain started pouring down, reducing visibility to almost nothing. I had no choice but to pull over and wait out the storm. As I sat in my cab, the rain pounding against the windows, I was filled with a sense of dread. I'd never encountered such a powerful storm before, and it felt like anything could happen. It was terrifying, yet thrilling all at once. I felt a chill run down my spine as if the intensity of the storm increased. The winds howled and lightning flashed, illuminating the sky in an eerie light. I wondered if I had made a mistake by stopping here, when I could have kept driving. But it was too late now. All I could do was wait for the storm to pass, and hope that no damage would be done. Suddenly, my radio crackled to life, with a voice warning of severe weather ahead. In moments like these, there's nothing else you can do but listen and trust your instincts. As the rain continued to pour down, I knew that all I could do was stay put until it let up enough for me to continue on my journey safely. Little did I know, my journey had only just begun. All of a sudden, something caught my eye in the woods off to the side of the road. At first, I thought it must have been some animal or maybe some debris that had blown out of someone's car window on their way down the mountain. But as I looked closer, what appeared in front of me stunned me into disbelief. Through the pouring rain, I tried to see what had caught my attention. It seemed to be a massive grizzly bear 
standing near the tree line where I had parked. It was so large that I thought that it had to be an optical illusion, yet it still sent a chill down my spine. Suddenly, the lightning flashed, lighting up the area, and what I saw sent panic through my body, and I was frozen in fear. After a moment, I got the nerve to move. I slowly turned on the high beams of the truck lights to see if I could make out what was standing in front of my truck. As the bright lights hit the animal, I noticed that it had moved closer to my truck, and that's when I really got a good look at the massive beast. The creature stood at least seven feet tall, with dark brown fur covering its entire body. Its eyes were deep black pools that seemed to look right through me as I felt like time itself froze for those few moments as we stared at each other like neither one of us could believe our own eyes. And then, just as suddenly as he'd appeared, he disappeared back into the woods. As I stared in shock and confusion, I couldn't believe what I had just witnessed. It was as if he was some kind of mystical creature, not of this world. I tried to make sense of what had just happened, but in the end, I was left with more questions than answers and a sense of unease that lingered long after he was gone. My heart raced faster than ever before, and all kinds of thoughts ran through my mind. Was this real? Could Bigfoot actually exist? I couldn't shake off the feeling of fear and disbelief that had taken hold of me. I couldn't believe that I had just seen a creature like that with my own eyes. I thought about all the stories and legends I'd heard about Bigfoot and wondered if they could be true. My mind was racing and my heart felt like it would beat out of my chest. I really didn't know what to think anymore as I began to wonder if what I saw was real or just my imagination. I was still in shock as I sat in the cab of my truck, my gaze fixed on the spot where the creature had been standing. I was so absorbed in my thoughts that I didn't even realize the storm had passed and the rain had stopped. Once the reality of the situation hit me, I couldn't wait to leave the area and put some distance between myself and the traumatic experience. As I prepared to set off on the remote mountain road, the darkness was complete. Just as I shifted my semi into drive, I was startled by bright lights appearing behind me. I quickly realized that I had been alone on the road and there were no other drivers passing by while I had stopped for the storm. I waited for the vehicle to pass, but instead it stopped behind my trailer, illuminating blue lights. It was a state patrol. Feeling a sense of relief that I wasn't alone on the quiet mountain road, I patiently waited as the officer approached my truck. I watched as he walked up to the driver's side and reached my door. I slowly rolled down my window to speak with him. The officer greeted me with a friendly smile and asked for my documents. I handed them over, trying to steady my nerves. He took a quick look at them before turning his attention back to me. Just doing a little routine check, he explained. Is everything okay? Do you need any assistance? That storm that passed by was very rough, and we had a tornado in the valley. That did a little damage, he concluded. I told him I was fine and thanked him for checking in. He nodded, handed me back my documents, and wished me a safe journey before returning to his vehicle and driving off into the night. As I watched his taillight disappear into the darkness, I couldn't help but feel grateful for the unexpected encounter. I drove off, feeling a mix of emotions. The encounter with the state patrol officer had provided a sense of security but the memory of the creature I had seen earlier still lingered in my mind. I still felt a sense of unease and the question of whether it was real or not. 
I decided to focus on the road ahead and put the thoughts behind me. As I drove on, the darkness enveloped me and I felt isolated and vulnerable. But I reminded myself that I was in a large semi truck and on a well paved road and that I was safe. I continued my journey, keeping an eye out for any other surprises that the night might bring. The following day, after completing my delivery, I decided to take a break from driving and pulled into a truck stop. I made my way to the restaurant and sat down in a booth. It was still early in the morning and I was eager to get some breakfast. As I looked around, I noticed two other truckers sitting at a nearby table. I couldn't help but overhear their conversation and what I heard sent shivers down my spine. One of the truckers was relaying to the other an encounter he had on a mountain ridge. He described to his companion how he had seen a massive Bigfoot that pounded on his chest and let out a terrifying scream. The location he described was on the same road I had been driving on the night before, and by the sound of it, he was parked just a few miles ahead of me during the storm. Hearing the trucker's account of his encounter with a Bigfoot on the same road I had been on left me feeling uneasy. I quickly finished my breakfast, paid the bill, and headed to my truck. As I pulled out onto the road, I made the decision that I did not want to take the same route over the mountain again. Instead, I decided to take a different route toward home. I called my wife and told her I was coming home early, and for the first time, I began to consider giving up my trucking job. The thought of encountering the creature again was too much for me to handle. I felt like it was time for a change. Overall, the experience of encountering the creature on the remote mountain road was one that would stay with me forever. The fear and uncertainty it had left with me would not easily dissipate. It was clear that I needed to process and come to terms with what had happened. As I drove home, I couldn't help but wonder if what I had seen was real or just a figment of my imagination. But one thing was for sure, I would never forget the feeling of fear and uncertainty that had taken hold of me that night. The encounter made me realize that life is full of unexpected surprises and that sometimes it's best to take a different route and not to be afraid of change. Now that I'm retired and living in a city I love, I've had the opportunity to read many books and encounters with Bigfoot over the years. I've long felt that by sharing my own story, I would finally be able to let go of the weight I have carried for so long. And I knew that this would be the perfect place to tell it. On to the next one. I had a face-to-face -face meeting with an overly large and exceptionally spooky mountain monster. I can now honestly say I met a Sasquatch. I spent the last 15 years living on the Oregon coast, and although we moved here from Northern California, where the people are all not that different, the lifestyle is more relaxed here, and I've been able to hike in some truly wild areas. I can see why this strange animal is seen and reported, yet still remains unknown because it lives where most people would never go. I would never have seen the one I did had it not happened that I sort of dropped in on it. Occasionally, I enjoy just going back in some fairly non-scenic place where I won't run into constant troop of other hikers, photographers, exercise fanatics and kids. Having lived most of my life in and around population, sometimes it's nice to just be alone. To do that in the mountains of Oregon is difficult because it's just too beautiful. So sometimes I look for the seemingly unattractive areas in hopes I may find an unusual rock formation, gnarly tree branch, or just maybe find something that four million other people haven't seen. Well, 
This trip was even more than I could have bargained for. It was up on what's called Bald Knob in an area in the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest. I'd taken my old car up a road that was more of a trail, but not inviting. I'm sure to most people, because this particular route was full of large-sized rocks. I was up fairly high, and I could see Humbug Mountain. But this area was just not anything that would draw visitors. So, it was just what I was searching for. The road on the other side of this hill got worse, so I knew I'd have a private area to explore. I parked off the ruts and grabbed my pack, set off down into what looked like a really secluded canyon. The road soon ended, but there was a shallow gulch that led down to my left, and I found myself in a beautifully sheltered canyon that was virtually covered with pine trees. There seemed to be a well-traveled animal trail that kept steadily descending into this ever-deepening canyon, so I figured I couldn't get lost by staying on it, so I spent about two hours following it. I had to go quite slow, so I'm not sure how far down I was when I heard the sound of water splashing off to my right, and it seemed like it was almost directly below me. Leaving the trail, I slowly climbed, hand over hand, over a couple of huge boulders laying on the steep slope and the sound got louder, and now I could see part of a small waterfall coming from the cliff on my upper right, so I carefully went around the huge boulder. I had to hold on to its side with my fingers as my feet kept sliding on the steep gravel slope as I made my way slowly down until I was directly under the boulder and then my hands could no longer find anything on which to hold, as the rock was too smooth. My feet kept slipping on the open stretch of gravel, and then I lost it. I landed on my butt and slid on my back down about 30 feet at a fast pace, and then I dropped right off an abrupt edge and landed hard enough to take the wind out of me. But fortunately, I only dropped about three feet to where I thudded down, and there I sat, waiting for the stars to clear. I had landed on a small ledge, and below my outstretched legs, the slope dropped down to a very steep, funnel-like chute through a really bad-looking channel that was lined with huge rock walls. It looked like if you fell down that slope, you just have to keep going all the way to the bottom of the mountain. Fortunately for me, although I had a lot of pain, I wasn't broken. Gathering my senses, I looked around me. There on my right was a small pool that a trickling stream had been splashing into, and then it flowed off the far corner of the five-foot pond and disappeared from view off the backside. It was here that I saw the subject of my letter to you. I bet you thought I'd never get to it. It's just that this was the most exciting event that's ever happened in my life, so forgive me. Over a huge boulder to the side of the pond, and about 30 feet up, there was a huge, light brown-haired head. It had an ugly face, to be sure by human standards, more like a large gorilla-like animal, with rather large eyes and ears and kind of a flat nose with big nostrils and large but flat ears. I couldn't see its hands or arms, so it had to either be laying up there or standing behind that large rock. But all I saw was this very calm but seemingly curious animal. I say that because it had a smooth, dark-skinned face and its brow was wrinkled like an aging human would look. Then I got courage and very calmly said, hello. As nervous as I was, I was now more anxious at finding something I never believed really existed. Well, I guess I should have let it make the first move because the animal all of a sudden rose up a couple of feet, turned and disappeared. 
All I saw was a lot of long hair, but the rest of its body was behind the rock. Then I heard a couple of thumps, like it must have jumped and ran downward, and then nothing. I was not in good enough shape to try to climb up to where it had been, even if I had gathered enough courage. But I had scrapes and bloody spots all over me, and I was just very lucky to have not broken anything, except maybe my butt. I've never had so many abrasions and bruises at any one time before in my life, and I carefully and painfully made my way back to my vehicle. I think I must have taken three times as long to get home, and took over a month for the wounds to fairly well heal. You know, the funny thing about all of this is my next door neighbor is a retired Oregon State employee, and he happened to be mowing his front yard when I pulled into my driveway. And when he saw me slowly and painfully climb out of my Jeep, he came quickly over. I told him the whole story and asked him who I should tell about what happened, thinking I'd at least make the news. He started shaking his head and told me, I had better just forget it ever happened because no one would ever print it or even accept my stories. He wouldn't even allow me to use his name. As being a retired forestry worker, he was under a lifetime restriction against reporting, discussing, or even acknowledging the existence of Bigfoot. As I stood there, bleeding and suffering bodily, and now mentally, he explained that a great many of the BLM, forestry, and other state employees have seen and encountered these creatures and the rules about non-disclosure and absolute denial have been in effect ever since the first sightings were reported. The policy has multiple purposes, and after hearing him out, I could understand the devastation that would occur if the state agencies admitted to the existence of these beings. The forest would be flooded with hunters, and shootings would be rampant. People would create such destruction that it would be chaotic. After listening to his well-rehearsed presentation, I could see it was not his first recital, and I then understood why I too need to respect what I had experienced. On to the next one. In Otero County in New Mexico, two sisters were on their way to their mother's place to pick up children for a birthday party. As they turned onto the dirt gravel road to the house, they saw something sitting by the left side of the road. When the car light illuminated it, it stood up to a height estimated to be seven foot or more. One of the sisters refused to look at it after one glance. It was hairy all over with a kind of pointed head, long arms, and no neck. It moved off toward the river. The sister turned into their mother's driveway and did not see it again. They were very frightened, and were sure it was not a bear or a human. My husband and I were visiting our adopted family in August. Having arrived there on the 21st, we were in our prop-up camper parked by the river and behind the brush arbor across the driveway from Grandma's house. Next door to her house lives her son and his family. Her son was away on a fire, along with his son, but his wife and daughter were at home. On the 21st, we had set up camp, ate, visited, and went to bed early, around 11 p.m. Everyone was asleep except me, and I was drifting into sleep when I felt a very strong jolt to our camper, which made everything rattle. I thought it might be a horse or cow, but the impact was higher than a horse or a cow, like at the roof line. I was too scared to move, but didn't know why. Nothing more happened, so I went to sleep and told my husband about it the next morning. He sleeps like a log. On Saturday, August the 23rd, the whole group of us, maybe 20 people, had cooked and eaten outside, and after cleanup, we all sat around the fire in the brush arbor, enjoying the cool evening and visiting with old friends. I was talking and way off somewhere, kind of remember hearing a sound like a baby crying. The little girl sitting next to me said, Do you hear that? I responded that I didn't hear anything, 
and she said that weird howl. Immediately, the adults stood up and told the children to go to the house that it was time for bed. They all heard it, whatever it was. My husband and I and our two little granddaughters sat there for a short while, wondering what was going on, and then went to our trailer and went to sleep. The dogs barked and howled almost all night. The next morning, Sunday, August 24th, I woke up and went to the house for coffee. All of the family members were already there, talking. I listened for a while, and the topic of conversation intrigued me, so I asked what everyone is talking about. Dead silence. I jokingly said that it sounded like to me they were talking about Bigfoot. One then another of them began to talk about it, and I said, why didn't you tell me? Their response was that they didn't want to scare us off. I told them I'd been interested in this for years. Then the stories came out, such as the first one cited herein. Two of the grandchildren the previous night had been on their way to their grandmother's house as they turned off from the main highway to the old highway where there was a sharp left-hand curve in the road about fifty yards in, and where the remains of the old highway continues to a dead end to the right. They saw the being. It was right at the curve where they saw, crossing in front of their vehicle, a very large, hairy, long-armed figure, which they observed cross the dead-end portion of the road and crash up the hill through the brush. They continued on to Grandma's house. As we all sat and listened to this, every one of us believed them. L.S., a son-in-law, suggested that we all go looking for sign at the site where this occurred. L. is from Selawick, Alaska, and he is a hunter. I wanted to go, but was still in my pajamas and robe, so I told them to go without me. When I got there, they were gone, so I returned back to the house. When they returned, Lewis said there were droppings, tracks, and matted down grasses, and chicken feathers, but no sign of bones or other scraps. His view of the droppings as related to me then is that they don't belong to a bear or any other animal he knows of. They contain seed and plant materials and bore a resemblance to human feces, except for size and quantity. Before we got to Mescalero in early August, Grandma said she woke up early one morning and noticed a huge handprint on her dining room window which is a large window beneath which a table sits. She went outside to clean it off so the grandkids and others wouldn't see it and be scared. Grandma is proud of her flower garden of lilies, and she said the flowers were trampled down by something heavy. Again, there were no horses around. In the kitchen on August 24th, I was told that howls and screams occur frequently at night, and that they all have heard them and cannot identify them. They all remark about the bad odors they have smelled on night when the dogs which are tied up have barked and barked. One of the granddaughters was sitting in the living room one night watching TV when she happened to look out the window to see something looking in at her. All she could say was that it was big and hairy. The family advises that these strange sounds and occurrences began in their area about November. There is plenty of cover in this area, including a wash or arroyo in which Grandma and her daughters go to gather tea, which activity they told me they were now afraid to do. They told me that easy access to the river is why there are sightings. They do not believe there is anything they have done to have caused this. I was told that a mountain lion made his or her home on the ridge across from the house, but since these noises and sightings have happened, there is no sign of the cougar anymore. I spoke with Grandma a week or so ago, and she told me that the sounds are heard almost every night, at about 2 or 3 a.m. Her daughter worked with a man who was tracking owls at night for the EPA. While doing an owl study, evidently, he has seen and heard things on the ridge. There have also been reports of trash cans and dumpsters being rummaged through and people emptying their trash, catching something in their headlights at these locations. Witnesses were all family members. In this area, there are lots of local stories, one of which is a sort of legend involving a Hispanic woman who lives or lived near Captain, was supposedly kidnapped by a Bigfoot some years ago, 
and finally came home with lots of broken bones and pregnant. The child grew up looking funny, so I was told, and always looking for a fight. The family told me about an Apache man who was at a feast somewhere out on the reservation. He left the clearing where the ceremony was taking place and went to the woods to urinate. As he did so, something allegedly picked him up and flung him about. I'm told that this man is big, about six foot two tall, but he was tossed around easily and scared to death. One of the daughters said she had just read an article about some very large tracks being found around Alcali Lake between the town of Alamogordo and Las Cruces, New Mexico, on Highway 70. For some years, I have gone with my family to Mescalero to help cook for the 4th of July feast, which involved the coming out of the girls of the family. We have always camped at the family's place, however. I have been told that the sounds keep people who are camped out there at the feast grounds up almost all night. These sounds come up from the little canyon between the feast grounds and the rodeo grounds on the hill, almost right in Mesa Calero. The family has also told me of other incidents way back when Grandma was young. All of these incidents occurred at dark and late at night. The weather was typical late summer, hot in the day, cool and clear at night. Lighting in all cases was by vehicle headlights. This is rural area, so night lighting is usually from a yard light. These incidents occurred within the boundaries of the homeland of the Mesicalera Apaches in New Mexico. On to the next one. I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the summer during the September elk hunt. I had an experience while stalking for elk with a hunting buddy of mine. I had the feeling something was near, but could not tell what. I stopped and waited for a while, but nothing. When we started to walk again, we heard a very loud, low growl, and I mean loud and low growl nearby. I have been hunting for a long time now and have been in the wilderness since I was a boy and have never heard anything like this. It scared my partner very much, and since I was the only one armed with a firearm, he did not leave my side for the rest of the day. I had an idea of what it was, but kept it to myself, and did not want to scare my friend more. I told him it was just a bull in heat, and there was cattle all through the area. He kind of believed me. When we got back to camp, we kept the encounter to ourselves. A few other things happened that week. The next day, we found a bear hunting dog in camp. He was very scared of something, and very hungry. We tried to get a hold of him to check his collar, but he would have nothing of it. He would stay close to camp, but not close enough to get him. We finally had to leave him there. One of the witnesses was my hunting buddy, and the day before, six others hunting and sitting around the campfire. A hunting dog was found and some strange-looking elk rubs. It was early morning at 8.30 a.m., bright and sunny, high desert mountain, oak brush, pinion, and ponderosa pine trees. Also, the next day, I kept my eyes and ears open. Some of the elk rubs did not look right. Not till a couple of years later did I connect what I was seeing. Some of them were tree twists, not scrapes like an elk would do. Reading some books I have read say that Sasquatch marked their territory this way. Years later, I was deer hunting, this time with most of the same people, not in the same area. While sitting around the fire, I just happened to say something about Bigfoot. Some people laughed, but some did not. I took a chance and told them about the previous hunting trip. That night, I found out the night before I got there, the hunting party heard some loud screams and moans from the hill nearby. It scared them enough that they all armed themselves. Some of them to this day still do not believe, but I have played a recording of the Sasquatch sound for some of them, and they say that was what it was. I know that New Mexico would not seem to be Bigfoot country. Most people think of it as a desert, but it is not. We have one of the largest elk populations in the country, and lately we are having more sightings. Where I heard the growl is not far from the Colorado border, and two other sightings in southern New Mexico near Rudoso, which has a large elk herd. I know what I heard, and it was not anything I have heard before. Not a bear, or a big cat, or a bull. It almost 
sounded human and very powerful. It thrilled me and scared me, but I know it is real and out there. To think otherwise would not be sensible. On to the next one. Here's a little background about the events that led up to my encounter. I was preparing for a fall elk hunt in north-central New Mexico. I had gathered together a pile of clothing for donation to my favorite local charity. On the Wednesday before I was to leave on my hunting trip, I had taken this pile of clothing into my garage and was going to place them on a shelf to be delivered to the charity as soon as I returned from my hunting trip. I had just started to lean over my ATV when I wrenched my back. I was in the worst pain I had ever experienced. I crawled back into the house and climbed into bed. After about a day and a half bed rest, I was eager to go hunting, though my back was still in great pain. I somehow managed the three-hour trip to our regular hunting area. After arriving at the campsite, my brother, my cousin, and myself downloaded the three ATVs that we would be using on our hunt. This turned out to be a huge mistake on my part, as I aggravated my already sore back. We sacked out for the night. In the morning, we got up at about 5 a.m. We rode into the area that we would be hunting and separated. My brothers and I were going to stay on a traditional productive fence line. Since my back was hurting from the right up, my brother suggested that I take a stand and rest my back. I accepted his advice and took a stand near a clearing with a few good lanes. The weather, although clear and sunny, provided quite a chill. It wasn't long before the cold weather caused my back to tighten up. I was in excruciating pain. My first thought was to get into the nearest clearing where I could get the sun to shine on me and perhaps relieve the shivers. It was at this time that I had decided that relief was little more important than the prospect of bagging an elk. I literally crawled about 50 yards to the nearest clearing and leaned myself against a tree stump that stood no more than 20 inches above the ground. As I had hoped, the sun provided enough heat to stop the shivers. I was pretty much immobile, but the shivers were gone. As you can imagine, I was so focused on the pain on my back that I did not pay too much attention to my surroundings. It was about 9 a.m. at this point. As I was laying there, I kept hearing what I thought was a group of squirrels running up and down the forest pine that was nearest to me. I tried to lay as still as possible, but due to the pain in my back, my motions were jerky to say the least. I had my back to the sound that I thought were being created by scampering squirrels, but as my jerky motions forced me to work my way in the direction of the sound, I caught a glimpse of a softball-sized rock bouncing off the trees. At first, I was a bit stunned at this. Then, I recall some old folklore that referred to rock throwing as a trademark of the Sasquatch. Suddenly, the realization hit me that in my condition with back pain, there was no way I would be able to defend myself in a confrontation. I tried to rationalize these flying rocks, but the thought of a hunter trying to scare game out of a relatively open clearing just did not jive. Besides, there was no way that even a pretty physically fit man could heave rocks of that size with a force that I would describe as dangerous if the rock was to have hit a person. For more than a couple of minutes, I would have to say that the rocks were being thrown at intervals of less than a minute. At this time, I was really starting to worry and was scared. Besides the sound of the rocks bouncing off the trees and hitting the ground, there was absolutely no noise. Well, the beating of my heart was pretty loud in my chest. I decided that something was really not right. I called my brother on our two-way radio. He was about 500 or 600 yards away. By this time, the rock throwing had been going on for at least an hour and ten minutes. My brother arrived and saw the rocks as they bounced off the trees and landed one by one just yards away from where we were huddled. If he hadn't seen and experienced the same thing I was, I would wonder if the whole experience was a hallucination. We talked about this strange event for a few minutes, and we glassed the tree line for any sign of what we could conclude could only be a creature throwing in what had to be an overhand motion, judging from the velocity of the flying stone. 
My brother and I witnessed this together for about 30 minutes after he arrived. To this day, I have pondered what might have thrown those stones. The only two possibilities other than a Bigfoot that would have been possible validly are a bear rooting or another hunter. But based on the size of the rocks being thrown, the velocity and the length of time they were being thrown for, it seems unlikely that either of the other two possibilities are in fact true. My brother and I are both experienced woodsmen and have hunted that area for a number of years. I've spent a great deal of time reading Bigfoot encounters online. The thing that strikes me in particular is the pattern of stories in which the witness claims silence. These creatures seem to have the ability to move through the forest without making a great deal of noise. That is one other factor that makes me believe that my rock throwing experience was an interaction with something that is not yet known to science. Here are two more bits of information that may be of interest. First, the rocks were exiting the tree about eight feet off the ground. They were being thrown with pretty extraordinary force. Second, the terrain was relatively rocky. After the rocks stopped flying, my brother and myself ventured toward where we thought the rocks came from in search of whatever track or sign we could find. But due to the rocky nature of the terrain, we were unable to find a trace. There was an eerie silence. There was no sign of animals, as I recall, just silence prior to and after the rock throwing. This area is heavily wooded and incredibly huge. This event occurred between 9 and 10.30 a.m. It was clear and sunny. The environment was very thick forested area. Elevation was approximately 8,800 feet above sea level. At the time of the occurrence, I was located about halfway down a ridge. On to the next one. Every time I take off for my favorite hike in the back of my extensive property, I seem to notice certain subtle changes in the scenery, especially when the Bigfoot creatures are about. This was in my mind as I took my familiar route that led from the public campground bordering my property down along the river and through that slot canyon that came in from the right side near the bottom of that treacherously steep slope. I had traveled this area quite often after my two months of in and out of the hospital recovering from malaria. I should say learning to live with the fact that it can reoccur at any time gives me an insecure feeling. I contracted malaria on my last and final trip to South America on a mission for my church and the completion of my service of two years of humanitarian effort that had been quite successful. So, I took great pleasure at having been of help. After my final devotion to service for the Lord, I now was looking forward to total relaxation. My sister had watched over my home and property during my absence over these last years, and I was more than grateful for her diligence in having the gardeners maintain my land, and even making sure my old jeep had a full tank of fuel and a charge in the battery. I was now ready to embark on a goal I had set when I purchased this place from my father's brother a few years back, after he had lived there for 30 years. Uncle Freddy had been injured at the mill where he worked for most of his adult life and took an early retirement on the generous insurance settlement. And since he had never married, he decided to spend his final years in a local retirement home where he had several friends who kept urging him to join them. My father had suggested that I purchase the property when I was myself retiring and Uncle Freddy was more than generous in his price, saying he was glad to keep the place in the family so he could still visit me on occasion, to which I gladly concurred. My own wife had taken ill on our last mission for the church, and she had unfortunately passed away while I was still hallucinating in my malarial stupor. It had been a terrible last two years, so now all I wanted was to be alone with my memories and my two newly acquired dogs, Mutt and Jeff, who I had named after an ancient comic book that I had found when cleaning out the attic when I moved in. These names seemed to fit my furry companion. My ranch, as I chose to call it, is not too remote, 
but the country road ends just past my property with a wide turnaround, so most everyone knows that there is little sense to further drive it unless to see me, and that seldom happens. Even the traveling salesman quickly learned the meaning of no. The home just before mine belonged to an elderly couple whom I will occasionally wave to on my trips to and fro, but we still have never met, and that seems to work for us. The snowplow and the mailman are about the only visitors which suit me fine. I think I'd lived here about a year when I saw my first Bigfoot. I knew instantly what it was, because my father had told me way back to ask Uncle Freddy about his freeloading sharecroppers. Uncle Freddy had seemed rather standoffish about my request, and it took him a few minutes before he replied. He said, tell your old man to stay out of it. Then, after a minute, he realized that if I were to live here, it was only fair that I should know. His demeanor suddenly changed then, and he began by telling me that there were just a few of these animals living in the forest behind my property, and then... Freddy couldn't hold back any longer, and he filled me in on what his secret was. Had I not grown up hearing stories about these Bigfoot animals, I would have thought he was crazy, and even though the stories were rampant in this area, I had never personally seen one. Uncle Freddy explained that I was likely to never even see one, as the small family of them lived far back in the canyon that began at the far edge of my property and to even get there was a chore. Uncle Freddy went on to tell me that years before, when the federal government closed off the entire area adjacent to my back property line, they had totally bulldozed the entrance to that section of the canyon, as there had been too many emergency calls to rescue the four-wheelers who bit off more than they could chew. The park's budget being cut, he told Freddy, they had fewer resources for rescuing idiots. Although, having never seen one of these Sasquatches, I also had never seen the Boogeyman either. But when I was a kid, I believed he was real, and that had never been disproven either. While Freddy was explaining all of this to me, I thought back to those days in my youth to the old men sitting around that big wood stove at Dawson's General's door who told stories of Bigfoot. So why would I even dare to doubt the word of my own father's brother? Freddy hadn't made a big deal out of it, so I gave him my word that I would keep planting the potatoes and that I would care for the apples and peaches that he said he'd raise strictly for his friends. Since he told me flat out that this was the only condition of sale, I readily agreed. He had one more add-on to my commitment, and that was that I would do my utmost to protect these Sasquatch because they were just another of God's creatures that needed our protection to survive. Although still somewhat skeptical, I agreed. Anyway, after all of my travels, I was home to stay, and I could finally see the property that I had never even been more than a few hundred feet out in. As I mentioned before, I was indebted to my sister for periodically hiring yard maintenance people and her occasional visit to check on everything in all of my frequent duties and I now could finally relax. This had been curious about why I wanted the fruit trees maintained, and who it was that kept constantly harvesting it, but when I just said, friends, she gave me a knowing grin, and the gleam in her eyes told me that she knew about them. I reasoned she may have been only testing me. So now, with a couple of good-sized water carriers and some snacks of sorts for myself, Mud and Jeff, I buckled my revolver and shell belt, and we were out the back door to our own private corner of the National Park, where even the rangers have likely never set foot upon. In all the short trips I have made in this area, only one time did I ever see another human, and that was a lone hiker on a ridge far away. This very remote corner is 24 miles from the secondary entrance to the park, with only one small toilet, so most all visitors use the main entrance that is yet another 20 miles in the opposite direction. With budgets being constantly cut, it is in the ranger's best interest to concentrate visitors closer to where they can control and monitor the flow. Another factor to discourage visitors to my end 
is that overnight camping is prohibited in the entire region. Uncle Freddy had told me that the Bigfoot family moved in shortly after the government had restricted this area from further services, and they were not in great numbers. But after living here a while and knowing they were safe, he began seeing more signs of them. And they no longer were walking, so as to intentionally avoid leaving a trail. With tourists swarming all over the forest searching for them, who would even guess that a family of these creatures would be living so near a home and being nourished by their own private produce orchard and potato patch? The dogs and I were soon enveloped in the massive forest area that stretched for so many miles in this remote corner that I had never before been so far in, and there was nothing familiar after we had traveled for several miles. The area was rapidly descending into the ever-widening canyon and as I glanced around at short intervals so as to not lose my footing on the rocky areas where the ground was covered by various sizes of rocks laid bare by the spring runoff. Seemingly, out of the cliff itself, a rivulet of clear water suddenly began running alongside the trail, which caused us to more carefully watch where we stepped. This stream grew wider until we finally arrived in a beautiful canyon, stretching to our left and right, and our stream had made a gradual curve to the right and was joined by another stream coming in from our left. The water was now about two feet wide, and the crystal clear runoff was now about a foot or two deep. The canyon's walls were now gradually narrowing, and the descendant had steepened to where we had to constantly be aware of every step in the constantly narrowing wall. There was little vegetation, and what there was seemed to be made up of primarily sagebrush and various sorts of gnarly bushes that were literally covered with thorns that threatened to rip flesh and clothing to shreds, and the dogs knew to steer clear, and that kept me safe as well. I had expected to see grasses growing alongside the stream, but judging from its obvious snake-like course, the water seemed to wander through ever-changing routes which I related to the frequent thunderstorms that often visited this area. As the canyons began to level off, I could no longer see where we had made our descent, and everything behind us looked to be a constant repetition of the scenery up ahead. I kept thinking if there was a quick rain that obliterated our tracks that I should have marked our exit with some of the red flagging in my backpack. That thought gave me cause to tie a long flag on a nearby sage, and I also made a mental note of how long it had taken us to reach the spot. As I had checked my watch as we reached the bottom of the canyon, my intention had been to try to relate how far we went in the same direction from which we had come from the house. Later on, I intended to see if there was a direct route from the house to the canyon without having to make this rectangular trip since this was such a strikingly beautiful place, perhaps I could find a shortcut. I found this remote area to be seemingly untouched by humans, which I'm certain was due to the fact that everywhere else in the park had more items of interest, and that suited me just fine. I stopped finally to grab a snack and give my kids a couple of treats. And since they seemed to prefer drinking repeatedly from the cold, clear stream, I didn't worry about rationing my water. Another thing making this area so peaceful was that the air traffic here was forbidden due to the area being a national condor reserve. A nesting pair of the nearly extinct bird was known to be within the park's boundaries, so that prevented private plane owners from scouting this entire area. That worked for me. As we traveled further in the canyon, another thought hit me. The very noticeable fact that there were no cigarette butts, no candy wrappers that normally accompany human-occupied areas. How nice. Now, the sand dunes were almost as hard as clay due to the constant sun, and the walking was easier now as I barely was sinking in the hardened sand. The canyon had narrowed slightly, and the stream had gradually widened as it was continually being added to by small streams feeding into it. Vegetation was almost totally absent, and this was understandable 
because the signs of frequent flash floods made it impossible for any vegetation to gain a foothold. The stream was deeper now and ever-widening as it headed rapidly to emerge into the rich agricultural area 50 miles away. Here I was, able to step across the water that further downstream would become a raging torrent. I was thinking about how wonderful it was to be totally away from human presence when my daydreams were shattered by the monstrous footprint directly before where I was about to step. There was a distinct print that had to have been made by a Sasquatch. I had been aware of certain depressions in the sand, but I supposed them to have been made by a large elk. But since the drifting sands had all but filled them in, I thought little about it. Now, however, it was different. This print had the very definite impression of toes. Thoughts raced through my mind, wondering if this giant was close by, and if it would know that I was the one who constantly supplied it and its family with food, or if it would rip my head off instead. The depressions near the stream were more prominent in the damp sand, and, placing my foot in one of the prints, I could still see the large tracks all around, the sole of my size 11 boot. That was sufficient to totally grab my attention, and Mutt and Jeff were snorting around the tracks as if the scent had lingered, and the hair on their backs was standing straight up. That, plus the fact that the water was faintly building in the print, told me it was very fresh. They both began growling, and their lips started to curl slightly, but this is where I was glad I had them professionally obedience trained, as they stayed right beside me. My hand automatically felt back to touch the security of the revolver on my belt, but from the size of those prints, I certainly didn't feel all that secure. Then my mind pictured what I would feel if my holster had been empty. My retreat would have been instantaneous. I had long thought of what would happen if I really met a Sasquatch, but in my heart, I never really expected I would. I don't know that I would never shoot one, but beyond that, I never thought any further, as it had been hard for me to even accept their existence, let alone what I would do if I ever met one. The way ahead was rapidly narrowing as the gorge curved slightly to our left, and now it seemed to be descending at a much steeper grade. The cliffs on each side were much closer together now, but I could see in the distance that after passing through this narrow place, the canyon opened again to its prior width, and that helped me relax a bit. Now, as I stepped cautiously forward, my mind assaulted my senses with a vivid picture of this giant monster ripping my head clean off and throwing it at my dogs. That mental picture gave me no desire to hurry in order that I may catch up to it, and I was perfectly content to set an even more leisurely place. Mutt and Jeff were walking a bit faster as I was sure they had no reservations about catching up, as they showed no fear, only the hair standing in ridges on their backs and the excitedly wagging of their tails and rapid turning to give me their anxious look like, hurry up, dad. As I stumbled through the damp sand, I lost any concern about a face-to-face -face confrontation with this beast as my only worry was to protect my overzealous dogs when they disappeared over a large dune and I desperately lunged forward in my exhausted state, wishing belatedly that I had leashed them back up because they paid no heed to my voice calls. As I topped the dune, I sank to my knees at the top, too exhausted to go any further. I knelt there, gasping for breath, and way up ahead, I caught movement in the sage growing abundantly on the far sloping wall of the canyon. There, on the bottom of the steep slope, stood my boys, staring up at the giant Sasquatch that was climbing up the wall, its huge feet sending waves of loose sand downward as it struggled toward the slope. My guys stayed at the bottom, staring up at the retreating beast that they no longer seemed to have any further interest in pursuing. A blast on my dog whistle was all it took and they began trotting back to me, as if relieved to not be expected to attack the object of their pursuit. I watched as the Sasquatch gained the top of the cliff, and it turned to look at me. It was really interesting, as there I was, 
watching this almost mythical animal, and I so wished that I could communicate with it. Without even thinkingly, I subconsciously raised my right hand and gave a long, slow wave, as I would a close friend. I felt embarrassed when I caught myself waving at this wild animal. However, I was exhilarated when the huge creature returned my gesture with the same long, slow wave. Then it abruptly entered the forest and disappeared. The Sasquatch was long since gone when my boys were laying at my feet, tongues hanging out and taking turns lapping water from their collapsible bowl. Well, time truly does fly, and it's been almost a year since our Bigfoot adventure, and the three of us are preparing for another excursion into Bigfoot's home, only this time we go in style. I found an old map which there is an ancient logging road that rounds through my property, and it shows where it intersects the canyon at about the same place as the Sasquatch was last in sight. The boys and I are practicing our exploration with our new four-wheel drive off-road machine, and it even has a switch to run on battery only, so we can soon be sneaking in the back way to see that Sasquatch. This time, though, we're bringing gifts from our orchard, On to the next one. I have a theory that I've never heard anyone else ever mention, though I doubt if I'm the first to come up with it. It requires that you believe in Bigfoot, which I know a lot of people don't. Now, I personally do, but only because of the incident I'm about to tell you about. But before that, I was as skeptical as they come. After all, as a fire lookout in one of the most rugged and remote national parks in the United States, if anyone should see them, it would be me. And I hadn't, even after 20 summers in the lookout towers. I'd seen every other kind of critter out there, including the elusive wolverine, which very few have ever seen. Oh, and I've seen several lynx which the biologists didn't even think still live in Glacier. But Bigfoot? Ha! Huh. A giant ape running around the forest? Fat chance. How could something that big hide, and what would they eat? After all, the area already has over 700 grizzlies, plus probably easily that number of black bears. How do I know that? Well, the park and some other group did a bunch of studies using thousands of hair samples from bears. Samples collected from strands of barbed wire attached to trees. They found that 765 grizzly bears live in that region, and most are concentrated in and around Glacier. So, if you add the black bears to the grizzly, you have at least 1,000 bears trying to find eat in the area. And that's a lot of food considering how much a bear can consume. I figured that Bigfoot, if they really were as large as everyone says, would need more food than a grizzly. And how much could one ecosystem maintain, even if Bigfoot were herbivores? It would still take a lot of food. And did they hibernate? What would they eat in the winter if they didn't? The whole topic seemed ludicrous to me. And after spending so many hours in a lookout tower, scanning the forest with a scope, if Bigfoot existed, I'd be the most likely person on the planet to spot one. And I hadn't. Hours and hours and hours in a tower with a scope, and not one Bigfoot. In fact, I'd never even heard anything that could possibly be one. Not one howl or wood knock or that famous siren call they supposedly make, and I was friends with all the other lookouts, and none of them had ever seen one either. So, back to my theory, but first, let me ask you this. If you were someone who was trying to hide in the forest, could you do it? I bet very few people could, but I know there are some who can. You'd need to be stealthy, especially if your life depended on it. It's probably something you'd get good at if you had to. I remember reading about some guy in the woods back east 
somewhere who lived for some 20 years in the forest near a town and stole campers' food and even their supplies, but nobody knew he was there. That's a long time to go undetected, and there are other stories like that of people living not that far out, and yet nobody knows they're there. So my point is that, yes, people can effectively hide in the woods. We're not as big as Bigfoot, but we're not exactly small either. And someone could even evade a lookout scope if they knew where to go and where not to go. So I at first thought I'd see a Bigfoot if they existed from my vantage point high on the ridge. But I then started thinking that maybe they were good at hiding. If they knew where the humans hung out, they could avoid such places and never be seen. One thing that sets humans apart from other animals is our ability to adapt to different situations. That's why we're the ultimate invasive species. We can go anywhere and survive, and we've basically invaded the entire planet. If you think about it, it's kind of amazing, as we're really gimpy physically. No big teeth or claws, but we're smart and know how to make tools. I was beginning to think maybe Bigfoot was smart, but could they make tools? Not a chance. So I spent a lot of hours in my lookout thinking about this. As you might guess, I had a good friend who claimed he'd seen a Bigfoot over by Swan Lake not far from Glacier, and his story seemed authentic, though I was skeptic. He wasn't a lookout, but he was an honest guy, not one to make up stuff, so it really got me thinking. And so, these things ran through my mind. When you're in a lookout tower, there's lots of time to think. So, my theory goes like this. Everyone says Bigfoot is an ape, maybe even something descended from Gigantopithecus, that giant ape they found a jawbone and some teeth from. Everything I've read, everyone I've talked to just assumes Bigfoot's an ape, related to humans, but in a distant way. If you look at the biology, humans and apes are related, but it goes way back. But what if Bigfoot is actually closer to our family tree. Maybe something like Neanderthal. Something not so different. What if they have brains that compare to ours and can think like ours? We're finding more and more evidence that Neanderthals were really smart. Maybe Bigfoot is like some of the hominoid species we studied in school, like Homo erectus, not so far removed from us. If they can think like a human, like we do, they could thereby figure out how to elude us. Okay, back to my fire tower experience. The reason I now believe Bigfoot exists and is very close to being human. But first, some history about where I was. Glacier's a big park, and it's seen its share of fires. It was established in 1910, and in the park's first decade, an average of 30,000 acres of forest burned each year. Because of this, it became the first national park to establish firefighting procedures, and part of this included fire lookout towers. The park built 17 such towers in the 1930s, mostly all two-story wooden structures with a windowless dirt floor storage area topped by a small room in which the fire lookout worked and lived. Of that 17, only four are still manned, Huckleberry Mountain, Numa Ridge, Galplock Mountain, and Swift Current Mountain. My job was managing the Numa Ridge Lookout over on the northwest side of the park near Bowman Lake. The side of the park I was on is on the drainage for the north fork of the Flathead River, and it's probably the least visited part of the park because it's hard to get into. You need a good high clearance vehicle and the road is bumpy and narrow and long. And of course, we're only maybe 20 or 30 miles from the Canadian border, which is even less inhabited and has lot more rugged country. Biologists say this region is probably the most significant in the entire country for predator habitat 
which means it's barely untouched. And when you're manning a lookout tower up there, it feels like you're the only human on the planet. Now, as you can probably imagine, lookout duty can get really boring. You spend the day scanning the countryside looking for smoke, sometimes just casually looking, and sometimes through a scope. But other than that, you have no real duties. The most exciting thing that ever happens is when a big storm comes through and you're in the thick of it, lightning popping all around while you wonder if the tower's going to get hit, which is quite an experience when it does, even with a lightning rod on the roof. Then the storm moves on through and you're left trying to spot any fires that may have been started by lightning. Sometimes they smolder for days, so you have to stay on it long after the storm is gone, constantly watching and being alert. But most of your time is spent keeping an eye out, nothing happening, bored, with only so many books you can read, only so many games of solitaire before you feel like you're going stir crazy. Even though you're out in the most beautiful place on earth and wouldn't want to be anywhere else, 10 days of this, then you get a break and can go out and get resupplied, take a shower, eat a real meal at some cafe, do your laundry, talk to some real human beings as opposed to those in your head, then go right back out. Of course, it being Glacier, occasionally some intrepid hiker will show up at the tower wanting to ask a gazillion questions and take photos, usually of themselves with you, on the tower stairs, which you gladly agree to do for the chance to talk to someone. And this is pretty much what started everything. A Yahoo named Mark, who came to see if he could raise hell, which he did. I'm kind of joking about the raising hell thing, because I don't think he had any idea what came from his visit. So I'm pretty sure that's what started it all. So, it's a nice, sunny day, no storms to be seen. And here comes this young guy, maybe in his late 20s, and very fit which you have to be to hike the 5.6 mile long trail, which gains almost 3,000 feet in elevation. It's a stiff hike, and even though I did it every couple of weeks, it would still get to me. Though going out was relatively easy, being all downhill. So I'm in the tower, studying a distant meadow that looks kind of smoky, trying to figure out if it's just mist or actual smoke when I hear this guy shouting from below. The tower has a small deck which connects to the stairs, so I go out to see what's going on. Well, this guy's down there, yelling, wanting to come up to the tower, saying something about trying to spot his buddy. Now, all the towers have a metal chain you can pull across the staircase leading up to the lookout area, along with a private sign. We put these up when we need privacy for various reasons. I had my sign up as I wasn't in the mood for visitors, but this guy just took it down and came on up. I was pretty torqued, but at least he tapped on the window before barging in. He was such a happy-go-lucky guy and so enthusiastic, I didn't even get a chance to say anything before he's offering me a beer. Not many hikers carry beer, and it was a rare treat for me, so I obliged and let him come in. He asked all kinds of questions, fascinated, then said his name was Mark, and he wanted to sign up to be a lookout. I seriously had never seen anyone so enthusiastic about being a lookout, though lots of people ask about it. And I'll jump ahead and say he was serious, as I ran into him the following season down in Apgar, and he told me, he was manning the Huckleberry Tower. I didn't have the heart to tell him what happened after he left. The views at Numa Ridge are stupendous, and Mark wanted to know the names of everything. So I pointed out Rainbow Peak, Square Peak, Mount Carter, Bowman Lake, Akokala Lake, and Longbow Lake, along with some other peaks and such. I really took a liking to this guy, and since he wanted to see if he could spot his friend fishing down by Bowman Lake, I showed him how to use the scope. Bowman Lake's too far away to actually see anyone fishing, so that was a disappointment, I guess, until 
he said he could see two guys over in a small meadow on a distant hill. I took a look, and sure enough, there were two guys in the remote patch of green, a small clearing in the forest. They were far enough that I couldn't make out much, but they seemed to be digging for something. It seemed really odd to me, for in order to get to where they were, they'd have to do some serious bushwhacking. Mark was back on the scope, and he got all agitated and said there was a bear heading their way. I took another look, and sure enough, I could make out a bear heading for the clearing. There wasn't anything we could do about it, so I just watched, hoping they had bear spray. Mark went out on the deck and started yelling in their direction, which I thought was a pretty hopeless thing to do, given how far away they were. But now I could see them stop and look our way. I was incredulous. The wind must be carrying his voice just right, or else they had extremely acute hearing. They quickly disappeared into the trees. All this took only a few minutes, but it left me with an odd feeling. What were they doing over there? Backcountry campers need permit and glacier, and even at that, you're only allowed to camp in certain areas. I knew there was no trail or camping where they were, and... They didn't even appear to have packs or any gear, and digging was totally illegal, as this was kind of a disturbance in the park. Well, Mark hung around for a while, then headed back down the trail to Bowman Lake. As he left, I had the strangest feeling, kind of a premonition almost, that I should go down with him. I generally liked my job as a lookout, the privacy and solitude and beauty, but I suddenly had the feeling that things weren't as they should be. Call it a hunch, but I'm pretty sure in retrospect that it was from the two figures we saw. I watched Mark head back as I started wondering again what the pair was doing way over in the little clearing. Why had they slipped into the forest upon hearing Mark yell? Or had they even heard him? Maybe the timing was just a coincidence and they'd instead realized a bear was nearby. The rest of the day was quiet, no visitors, and when evening came, I found myself not wanting to take my usual short hike to stretch my legs, but instead wanted to just stay in the tower. It felt secure. I figured I felt that was from seeing the bear, but then I see bears every so often from up there and have never felt that way. Now, the Numa Ridge Lookout has a heavy wooden panel with 200 spikes driven into it that you can drop into place on the stairway for protection from grizzlies. I didn't usually do this, as it's heavy and a real pain to do, but that night, I dropped it into place. Sometimes, I would listen to my little battery-operated radio in the evenings while watching sunset. But that night, I pretty much hunkered down and kept a low profile. I even got out my shotgun. At the time, guns weren't illegal in the park. They are now, but only if unloaded. And I don't know if any other lookout had arms, but I suspected they did. You kind of feel like a sitting duck up in a tower. I also had bear spray, but I'll just say the gun wasn't for bears. And let it go at that. Sometimes at night, I would go out on the deck and watch the stars looking for satellites and the space station and that kind of thing, and even the aurora borealis, if I wanted to stay up late enough for it to get really dark. Being that far north, the days were long in the summer. But that night, all I wanted to do was hide out in the corner of the lookout. Everything felt different, even creepy, which wasn't a feeling I'd normally had. I'd recently started keeping a journal on the advice of a friend who said I would someday enjoy reading about it all. Even though I told her there was nothing to write about, I started jotting down a few feelings and observations here and there, and reading it later, that night entry read, No idea why, but I suddenly feel like things have changed, and not for the better. My peace of mind seems gone, replaced by some kind of deep fear, and I don't even know what it is I'm afraid of. All I can think of is getting out. If things aren't better by morning, I'm heading down. Maybe I just need a break. Well, 
I dozed off thinking of being back home on my parents' farm in eastern Montana, out in the prairie. The house, surrounded by tall trees, grassland as far as the eye can see. I recalled all the time I'd watched big storms far away, fascinated by the huge anvil-shaped clouds rising over the distant horizon with their huge bolts of lightning so far away you couldn't hear the thunder. Except this time, I could. I woke with a start, realizing I'd been dreaming, but I soon knew it wasn't a dream. I could hear bolts of lightning hitting the ground nearby. Oh boy, there's nothing like being in a tower during a lightning storm, but I'd been totally unaware anything was coming in. I have a weather radio, and there hadn't been anything forecast. As I lay there on my cot in my sleeping bag, I realized there wasn't any light with the strikes. I wasn't hearing thunder, but rather, it sounded like something was whacking on the tower itself. I immediately thought of the bear we'd seen earlier, but... I'd never heard of a bear whacking on a building like that, though there was nothing that would keep them from doing so, so I'd seen them whacking on old logs to dislodge grubs lots of times. Let me describe the tower here for a minute so you know what it was like. First, it's square, with five windows on each side, and the deck goes all the way around. It's basically two stories high, so you're not climbing a lot of stairs to get into it like a lot of lookout towers. The bottom story is made of wood, and there's not really any place one could climb up into the tower except by the stairs, and like I said, I dropped the spike board, and even if you could climb the walls, the deck which jutted out would stop you. I haven't been back up there since all this happened, but I've been told it now has solar panels along one side, but when I was there, it was all old school and we didn't have any of the new high-tech equipment the lookouts now have. So, I was lying there, listening to this whacking sound, when I realized the tower was actually shaking a bit. That made me stop and think, I can tell you, for the towers in Glacier aren't up on stilts like some, but have solid foundation. Whatever was hitting the tower was putting some strength into it. My next thought was to wonder why a bear would do this. And let me add that the whole thing had a really malevolent feeling to it. Not like some bear messing around, but rather like something trying to psych me out. Does that sound paranoid enough for you? I actually lay there wondering if I wasn't going nuts. I'd heard stories about lookouts going crazy from the solitude and having to quit. In fact, there was a story that made the round about some guy over in the Swift Current Tower that had radio dispatched saying he was watching little green guys get out of a UFO right below the tower. He said later he was kidding, but you don't call dispatch for a practical joke, as it will get you fired. He didn't get fired because he quit shortly thereafter. I thought of those little green guys that night, then had to laugh at myself. Someone with the technology to come to Earth wouldn't be whacking the tower with a stick or whatever, They'd be able to come and go as they willed with jetpacks or whatnot. My next thought was that someone had come up during the night and was trying to scare me. I was about ready to call dispatch, but something told me to keep quiet and just see what happened. But I can assure you, I had my shotgun ready. Now, let's segue back to my theory about Bigfoot being human-like here for a minute. What happened next was pretty human-like in my book. The whacking stopped, and I could now hear talking. It was the strangest thing I've ever heard, and I wish there had been some way to record it. Imagine someone who spoke a language that was as foreign-sounding to English as possible, something with different sounds to it, even popping noises, then throw in an English word every so often. It's like someone speaking your language, yet they're not. You strain to understand, as it sounds kind of familiar, but the words aren't in any kind of sequence to make sense, and they're also formed with strange vowels and such. I can't really describe it, but it was just plain weird. It almost sounded like a record being played backward, if you've ever heard that. So, I was still there on my cot, though I kicked off my sleeping bag and was up on my elbows listening for all I was worth 
trying to understand what was going on. I strained to hear it all to make sense, but after a while, it dawned on me that it was something totally out of my range of experience. I finally figured out what was happening, that someone was trying to make me think they were speaking English, and next, they started knocking on the side of the tower like it was a door. I heard a guttural voice say, Open up, police. Well, that got me, but just for a second. I was actually starting to stand up, which would mean they could see me through the windows, as there was enough moonlight, but I quickly lay back down. Police? Up here? Not likely. And if there were law enforcement around, it would be park rangers. What the heck was going on? I then decided someone had come up during the night, or maybe they'd been hiding, but they were playing a little trick on me, or maybe even worse, they wanted me dead. That's actually what it felt like. I reached down and grabbed my shotgun, which was under my cot, and realized it wasn't loaded, picked up a shell and loaded it into the chamber, snapping the side shut, racking it. Now, that's a very distinctive sound and most people would instantly know what it was, or even if they had never heard a shotgun being racked, they'd know something was up. Nope, no effect at all. They either didn't know what a shotgun was, or had no fear of it. I wasn't sure what to do next. I didn't want to shoot someone, and even if it was justified as self-defense, I knew I'd end up in trouble for having a gun in the park. It then dawned on me, that all the windows were closed, so maybe they hadn't heard it. But I could hear them just fine, so that couldn't be. I knew I could go out on the deck and yell at them or something, but it seemed foolish, and I still felt that deep sense of dread. I'm no coward, but my instincts were telling me to stay inside and hunker down. Back to the human-like thing. What they did next was to start crying, it was the most pitiful sound, just like a little baby, and I wondered if maybe they didn't actually have a baby out there. I mean, how could someone with a low, guttural voice now sound like a tiny little baby? I'll admit they almost got me with that one, as I started wondering if they hadn't somehow kidnapped someone's baby and was going to harm it. But I ignored it, my sense of dread growing. Whoever this was, they were cunning and devious, and they seemed to know that a human baby in danger would get results. Though I didn't fall for it, I finally decided I needed to call dispatch and somehow get help. At that point, I didn't care if they thought I was nuts, as I knew I would be leaving and not coming back anyway, assuming I survived the night. I tried to stay low as I went to the radio and heated it on. The static was loud and I turned the volume down as I didn't want whoever was below to hear what I was saying. In a nutshell, I told Craig, the night dispatcher, that someone was trying to break into the tower and I needed backup. No, I hadn't been drinking. They knew I didn't drink alcohol. An occasional beer didn't count. And, yes, I felt like I was in serious danger. Well, this conversation was all in my head because as I started to key dispatch, I realized it would be hopeless as they wouldn't send anyone out at night anyway because of fair danger, not unless I'd broken my leg or something. After all, I was pretty secure up in the tower and Craig knew I was armed. The whole conversation would go south and I'd have to explain everything in the morning and it wouldn't do any good anyway. I was on my own. Well, that's when I turned and saw the face in the window. I was shocked, both by the fact that they'd managed to climb the wall, but also by what I saw. And as I turned, I saw a second face in the window behind me. Just as an aside, I found out later they hadn't actually climbed the wall, but had leaned a dead tree against the deck, then somehow scaled it. They had to be strong to move a log that big, and they had to be very agile to climb it, is all I can say. But, back to the face. Let me describe what I saw. It's not something one's mind can easily grasp. Sure, if it was in some horror movie, you'd think what a great job the makeup guys had done, 
and you wouldn't know it wasn't real. But in real life, not so easy. Your mind refuses to process it. Let me say they weren't huge like a lot of Bigfoot stories you hear. They were larger than an average guy, sure, but not anything you'd stop and stare at if you saw one on the street, size-wise anyway, though you would definitely stop. They were actually kind of wiry, but the reason you'd stop is because of the face. Now, the tower windows are tall, and I could see the hairy bodies as well as their faces. They weren't all that hairy like in some Bigfoot account, where people say the hair flows. Their hair was more like what you'd see on a deer or something, short and stiff. They had some facial hair, but not like a beard, more like all over except where their eyes were, and pretty short hair at that. But those eyes, man, those eyes, they were terrifying because they were large and black, and yet they had some kind of glow to them, sort of like backlight or something, not red or green like you read about. It was dark enough, even with the moonlight, that I couldn't really make out any facial expression, but I somehow knew they meant me harm. I didn't need to see any teeth or ugly scowls to know that. I could just feel it deep inside, and later, as I thought about all this more, I wondered if they hadn't somehow telepathed it to me or even produced some kind of ultrasound like I've read about in some Bigfoot account. I don't know. But I did feel very threatened. My next thought was of how easily they could break out a window and come inside. I edged my way to the corner of the room, then held up my shotgun, thinking maybe if they saw it and realized what it was, they would leave. I was beginning to wonder if I weren't having some kind of nightmare. I was shocked to see them both take off quicker than you can say, sick em. They obviously knew what a gun was. I stood there shaking, thinking it was going to be a long night, even if they didn't come back. There was no way I could sleep. I wondered if maybe I should start getting my stuff packed up and ready to go. The only problem was it was dark inside and there was no way I was going to turn on my headlamp. It would just make me a sitting duck, assuming they hadn't actually left, which something told me was indeed the case. I finally slumped down in the corner, tired and half asleep, and the next thing I knew, I could see the dawn lighting up the distant peak. I couldn't believe I'd survived. Had it all been a dream? I slipped out of my long john into my clothes and started packing my gear, which didn't take long. I finally settled down enough to have some breakfast, and as I sat there, drinking coffee and eating some bagels and fruit, I tried to quiet my mind enough to make sure leaving was really what I should do. If I walked out of my job mid-season, it would leave the park with no lookout along this northern region, which would be a bad thing. But maybe they could get someone else to come up, maybe even Mark, who'd been so excited about being a lookout. After all, it wasn't a skilled job. You just had to be self-sufficient and alert. Or maybe I should just take a break for a few days and then come back up myself. I could tell everyone I'd been sick or something. What would I do if I wasn't a lookout? It had been my seasonal job for many years, and I couldn't afford to not work. I decided to head out, then make up my mind once I got back down and into civilization. As the thought of coming back up and potentially having another night like I just had wasn't very appealing. I think I was still kind of hoping that it had just been a bad dream at that point. In fact, it still didn't seem real. Maybe I could clear my head by getting out of there for a while, then come back, though the thought of doing so gave me the creep. I finally had my gear together. I radio dispatched to tell them I was coming out, that I was sick. They were concerned, but I told them I was pretty sure I could do the hike down, as it was pretty easy not like coming up. I lost the tower then removed the spike board and went on down the stairs, wary, looking all around, shotgun in hand. But I saw nothing out of the usual, except the big log still leaning against the deck. I pushed it down, and it made a big thud. It was then that I realized how heavy it was. Two humans couldn't have lifted it. 
and set it against the deck like that, unless they were weightlifters, and even then it would be difficult. It gave me pause, and the fact that it hadn't been a dream finally set in. I turned to go when I saw something had been etched into the side of the tower, the lighter wood standing out against the dark brown paint. I was already getting a queasy feeling, wanting badly to flee, but I had to see what it was. As I walked over to the tower, what I saw was beyond strain. There, carved into the wood, was what I took to be a symbol, for what else could it be? Now, back yet again to my theory about these creatures being hominids close to us humans. Humans are the only animals that create and use symbols. When you think of Bigfoot, what comes to mind? Big feet, obviously, but also things like a huge thigh, long body hair, creepy glowing eyes, wood knocking, and weird sounds, and threatening behavior among other things. But what I saw there, carved into that tower, went way beyond all the stereotypes, for it indicated that whatever had made it was able to draw, to carve into wood, which meant they had opposable thumbs as well as a highly developed brain. It looked like a map. Maps are symbolic of the real landscape and exist to help one find their way. They are definitely considered to be symbols, though you don't often think of them like that. I carry a little pocket camera, and I pulled it out and took a photo, which I still have. I then felt a strong and very urgent desire to obliterate the map, and I took my pocket knife and scratched it out until all that was left was the raw wood. Having done that, I felt a need to flee, and I took off down the trail at a half run, suddenly feeling again like I was in danger, just like the previous night. I ran until my side started aching. Then I slowed down to a fast walk, all the while my shotgun at hand. I never heard anything behind me, but yet I knew I needed to get down out of there. Like I said earlier, the hike from Bowman Lake to the tower is around six miles, and I've never hiked six miles that fast before or since. Once at the lake shore, I slowed to a normal pace out of necessity, as I was winded. It was early, but I could see a couple of people out on the lake in kayaks, and that made me feel like I was back to safety. So I caught my breath and took a short break. I was soon at the campground where my pickup waited. I never looked back, and I haven't been back since. I quit my work as a lookout and instead stayed at my girlfriend's place for a few weeks, then headed down to Missoula, where I found a job in a quick lube place for the rest of summer, saving my money by sleeping in my truck in the parking lot. I felt safer there in the middle of town than I had at the lookout tower, which was opposite of what I would normally feel. I finally went back to Cali Spell and started working in a liquor store. My gal and I got married and started a lawn care business, and in the winters, we go to stay with my parents on their farm. But in the summer, we like to go fishing on the Flathead River. And I can see those big peaks up in Glacier. Peaks where I once lived. Sometimes I feel nostalgic for it, as it was a good life. But I know I can never go back after seeing that map. I printed it out and studied it, and it still gives me the shake, for there's no question about what it stands for, and I know these creatures aren't just intelligent, but they're also very cunning, and they don't mean us any good. What was the map all about? It has a rough sketch of the tower and a line going over to that meadow where we saw the two figures digging. I can still recall exactly where that meadow is, and I keep telling myself that someday I'm going to hike over there and see what's there, though I know I never will. The map shows the meadow, and there it has a sketch of what looks to be a human-like skull, almost as if someone had made the map to tell others where some kind of burial place was. I have a lot of questions, though I know they'll never be answered. Did one of the creatures make that sketch to show the others where the burial site was? A number of people have gone missing in Glacier with no trace. Are they buried in that meadow or in similar one in other places around the park? 
Was I destined to be placed there also? It still gives me the chills. As far as I know, no lookout gone missing from the Numa Ridge Tower, but it's possible that a hiker or two have from that area. I guess I'd rather just not know. On to the next one. When I was a kid, my friend and I discovered a Bigfoot ghost town. Before you laugh, let me tell the story, and maybe you'll agree it could be true. I'm Wally, and my best friend growing up was Ralphie. We grew up in the small town of Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Maybe you've heard of it, as it's a famous ski town in the northwest part of the state. It was the birthplace of ski jumping in the United States but that was before my time. I was a kid there before the ski industry really took off. So we learned to ski by hiking up the hills or having horses pull us around. It was a lot of fun, but way different than what's there today, a lot smaller too. When I was young, it had only about 2,000 people. Steamboat was named for the hot springs that would blow off and sound like steamboat whistles. That was also before my time, when they brought the railroad through. They blasted out the rocks that created the whistle in order to put tracks through there. The area still has lots of hot springs, and I grew up swimming in the hot springs pool there. It was fun to go there on a cold winter day and sit in the warm water while it snowed. We felt like royalty, sitting there in the stream and strong smell of sulfur. My parents both worked, my mom at the grocery store, and my dad at the local auto shop. So I had lots of time to get into mischief. I had a lot of great adventures, but the ghost town was the most unique without a doubt. Ralphie and I spent every waking moment together during the summer. We were best pals. We liked to bicycle around everywhere and explore. We ended up in some pretty crazy places like the time we rode to the top of Rabbit Ears Path and Ralphie's brakes went out, or the time we rode all the way to Hayden and had to call my uncle to come get us. That was a good 30-mile ride, and we're talking old clunker bicycles. Of course, he was sworn to secrecy and never told my parents. So, for us to ride down to Mount Harris a good 15 miles one way, was a good day's ride, but not unusual. We would pack a lunch and just take off all day. It was a great way to grow up. Mount Harrison was an old abandoned coal mining town just across the Yampa River from the highway. There was an old bridge crossing that was kind of scary as you could see the river through the planks. Then you cross a small area full of cattails and willows so you had to stay on the road. Then you're in the old town, which was kind of along the hillside, climbing right by the cliffs where the old coal mine had been. I don't know when it was operational, but way before our time. At the time when we were there, it was already pretty much a ghost town, and a lot of the buildings were in serious disrepair, with roofs caving in and windows broken out. A number of the better constructed houses had been moved by the locals to the neighboring town. Hayden, Craig, Milliner, even Steamboat, all had old Mount Harris houses that had been moved years before and refurbished for the people to live in. You could tell a Mount Harris house because they were all the same, square with a peaked roof and wide wood plank siding. The town's little school had been moved up by Craig some 35 miles away, where it was used as a rural school. They even moved the old desk. So me and Ralphie would go to Mount Harris when we felt ambitious enough for the bike ride and explored around. Sometimes we would sit up there on the hill and watch the occasional train go by, which wasn't very occasional as the tracks ended in Craig. We would go up there on an average of once or twice a month in the summer. It was our secret town, even though it was falling down. We liked to pretend we ran it, 
and we'd run off outlaws and bankers alike in our imaginary escapades there. Then, one day in late July, everything changed. We had packed our lunches and headed for our town, eager to run off some imaginary squatters we'd heard had come in. Rumor was they were looking for gold and planned on taking over the town. Of course, this was all part of a story we'd made up on the way out there to give the day some excitement. We crossed the old bridge and I immediately stopped yelling at Ralphie, who had gone on up the road toward the old town. He turned around and came back. Ralphie, stop and be quiet for a minute. Something different, but I don't know what. Ralphie stopped and grinned, thinking I was coming up with some plot or whatever to liven up the day. We stood there, but all we could hear was the rustling of the river as it went down toward Hayden and Craig. Ralphie soon lost his grin, though, and he eyed me suspiciously. Wally, you're just trying to get me worked up. I know it, he said. But something does feel different. What is it? I don't know, but things just don't feel right. I'm not making anything up. It just feels different. We stood there for a bit and even discussed turning around and going home. We both had a sensation that things were different. Not necessarily bad, but different. And... We couldn't put our finger on what it could be or why, but we both felt it, and the longer we stood there, the more defined it became, until we both felt like we were being watched. This is creepy, Ralphie said. It feels like there's someone or something watching us. It's making the hairs on my arm stand up. Yeah, mine too, I agreed. Maybe we should just go home. Maybe there's a mountain lion up there or a bear or something. Ralphie looked pained. He didn't want to go home. The day was young, yet he was a bit scared, as was I. Maybe our imaginary squatters weren't so imaginary. He figured out a solution. I know, Wally. Let's act like we're leaving. That will throw whatever it is off. Then let's come back down the river in the willows and hide out and spy. We'll be on the other side of the river, so nothing can get to us, but we can get pretty close. This sounded like a good plan, though I was feeling a bit like we should just leave. So we turned around and crossed back over the bridge and rode on back up the highway for a good half a mile, then hid our bike in the bushes and snuck back along the river in the willows. Our escapade was getting to be more serious than we'd planned, as we both had the feeling we could be in actual danger, especially if a wild animal were onto us. Of course, I later found out that cougars and bears usually go the opposite way of humans, but at the time, we thought we could even be stalked or something. We snuck back almost to the bridge where we could see up to the old town. We hid in some sumac, all scratched to heck from all the wild rose bushes along the river. We were persistent determined to figure out who had taken over our town. We even mentioned that since it was a ghost town, maybe some real ghosts had discovered it and moved in. You know how kids are. We managed to scare ourselves with every suggestion we could think of. So there we were, hiding in the bushes, spying on the town, of which, not so long ago, we'd been mayor and sheriff and ruled with an iron hand. We sat for a while, and the creepy feeling of being watched was gone. Everything seemed normal again. We whispered some, deciding we must have imagined the whole thing. We grinned at each other at the power of our imagination in kind of a proud way. Maybe we should go get our bikes and go on up there, Ralphie suggested. Just then, a rancid smell drifted down from the old town, almost making us gag. It was like a mix between garbage and a skunk. At the same time, I saw something moving behind one of the old houses. I grabbed Ralphie's arm and pointed. His eyes got big when he saw it, too. A bear, he whispered excitedly. A big black bear, and it's big. Now we saw another, and it appeared the two were talking or something as they were facing each other, gesticulating as if having a conversation. We were too far away to hear anything. 
They were huge, standing on their rear legs, maybe nine feet tall and six hundred or seven hundred pounds. They were thick through the torso, and their hair was a rusty reddish brown, sort of like an Irish setter's. A feeling of dread overcame me. I'm getting out of here. Let's go. We both ran like the wind through the bushes, never looking back, got to our bike and made record time back to town, which was uphill part way. We stopped at my house since it was the closest, puffing and my heart beating like I'll never forget. I thought maybe I was going to have a heart attack at the ripe old age of 13. We lay on the garage floor, trying to regain our senses, still scared. Do you think they might have followed us? Ralphie asked. No way, I answered authoritatively, though I wondered myself. I was afraid to sleep alone in my room for a few days after that, instead sleeping on the couch in the living room. We had many discussions in the following days about what we'd seen, but it always came back to having been bears. Keep in mind that at this time, Bigfoot was not a common topic and existed only in Canada or the Pacific Northwest. We rolled it around and around, trying to figure out what these really big bears would be doing in Mount Harris. And did bears really talk to each other and use their hands? Uh-oh, wait, these things had hands. Our discussions were getting more and more afield from bears, and we still couldn't explain it. We needed to go back and do more spying so we could rest easy. One more look and we could establish once and for all that they were just bears, hanging out, maybe using the old buildings for shelter, checking them out for hibernation places. You know how bears are. Maybe some Alaskan Kodiak bears had come into the area, migrated, because these weren't like any black bears we'd seen and there were no grizzlies around. Plus, these guys didn't have humps like grizzlies, and only Kodiak bears were that big. We had stumbled into a full-blown mystery, and were we mad enough to solve it? Or were we going to keep playing cowboy and outlaw games like little kids? We asked ourselves these questions until we finally worked up enough courage to go back, even though it took several days of false start. We would pack lunches and get ready to go, then something more pressing would come up, like needing to return book to the library or to check out new bikes at the hardware store, that kind of thing. Finally, the day came when we could procrastinate no longer, because school would start tomorrow. We had to go now, or the mystery would haunt us forever. We would no longer be able to claim our place in history as brave explorers but would go down as cowards. We took off, riding slow. I think we set a record for slowest ride that day. Except we made up for it on the way back, which probably even beat our last return as fastest ride ever. But we solved the mystery, and we paid a price for that. At least we no longer felt like cowards, but by then, being a coward was no honor lost. We wished we had been bigger cowards. We got to the place where we'd left our bikes in the bushes before. This time, we hid them so well, we almost couldn't find them in our panic on the way back. We snuck down the same route along the river, but this time even more quietly as we were dealing with something potentially life-threatening, whereas before we weren't sure. But now, we had secret weapons. Binoculars. We were scared stiff, but determined to know who had invaded our town, assuming they were still there. Almost to the spy spot, Ralphie stopped, whispering to me that he'd found something really strange. I nearly stepped on it and ruined it, but he pushed me aside at the last minute. A track, a really, really big track, right there in the sand along the river. Well-defined and maybe even fresh. Our tracking skills were a bit sketchy. I put my foot next to it, and my foot was warm, and I was a growing boy and wore size 10. We stood there for a bit until I stated the obvious. That ain't no bear track, Ralphie. He answered in a barely audible whisper. I know. After a few moments, I said, I think we should go home now. 
We're dealing with something we can't deal with, Ralphie. Ralphie answered glumly, I know, but instead of turning around, something drove us forward. We were almost to the spy spot, so we went on, settling in and nervously pulling our binoculars out of our pack. Things were different. Someone had destroyed the bridge. It looked like a bomb had hit it. There wasn't much there to start with, but now the planks dangled into space, almost touching the river. They looked like they'd been ripped apart. Holy crap, we both said at the same time. I wanted to run, but didn't. So did Ralphie, he later admitted, but neither of us wanted to appear to be cowards, even though we definitely were. We sat there, watching the old town site, scanning with our binoculars like a couple of war generals checking out the battlefield. We both saw movement at the same time, something big, squatting by one of the houses and stood up. It was one of the Kodiak bears, and it seemed even bigger than before, now that we could see it better. With the binoculars, I could see that this one was a burnished brown color, with long hair that seemed to hang off its arms. After it stood up, I could see that its arms hung clear down to its knees, and it was as muscular as any wrestler, even more so. It looked like it worked out about 20 hours a day. Now it walked around behind the building, and it had a long gait, covering a lot of ground in a few steps, swinging its arms. I could see another coming out, leading a small one by the hand, then another, like maybe a teenager in size. They stood there and appeared to be arguing, and when the wind was just right, we could barely hear them. It sounded like a combination of chattering noise and Japanese, if you can picture that, but was neither a sound of its own. Now, all of a sudden, the hairs on my neck were standing up, and I had that same strange feeling I was being watched. I looked at Ralphie, and I could tell he felt it too. We were being watched by something that didn't want us there, and maybe had some intent of harming us. But the things up the hill weren't even looking our way. Something spotted us, Ralphie whispered, looking like he was ready to cry. We need to get out of here now. I decided it was my chance to prove I was braver than him, so I replied, let's just stay a few minutes longer and see what they do. We're far enough away, we can outrun them. I couldn't believe what was coming out of my mouth, as all I really wanted to do was run like heck. We sat there a few more minutes, watching totally ignoring our instincts, we would pay. I knew it deep inside, but something kept me there, something more than curiosity and bravado. I figured one was the mom because she was leading the young one. She now turned and looked straight in our direction, as if sensing us. I was the one closest to her, and I suddenly doubled over in pain. It felt like someone had kicked me in the stomach, hard. I couldn't move. I rolled around on the ground, writhing in pain, trying not to cry out. Ralphie sat there dumbfounded. Ben tried to help me, but he didn't know what to do. I was now moaning in pain, and he kept telling me to be quiet, they'll hear us, to be quiet, in a panicky voice. The pain stopped as suddenly as it started, and I sat up, tears running down my cheek. My God, Ralphie, it felt like she kicked me in the stomach. God, that hurt. Wally, I don't know what happened, but those ain't bears, and they made you hurt. Let's get out of here. I took one last look as I got on my feet, just in time to see two of the big creatures running down the hill toward us. But what was worse now, that I could see one coming down the other side of the river toward us, not all that far away. They were all moving over rocky terrain at a frightening speed. I immediately thought that nothing that big should be able to move that fast. Run, run, I screamed, no longer trying to be quiet. Ralphie couldn't help but look, and he started screaming too. We both ran like the wind, afraid to look back. We knew they had to swim the river, but it looked like something they could do in just a few strokes, or maybe just jump across it in one jump. I really don't remember anything except riding our bikes back along the highway as fast as we could. We were in a total panic, and I knew we would die soon. We even tried to wave down the few cars that we saw, but nobody stopped, and we didn't dare stop either. 
we ended up back on the floor of my garage. But this time, I was sure I was dying. My stomach hurt like heck, and I couldn't catch my breath. After he recuperated a bit, Ralphie offered to call my parents or the ambulance or something. He said he sure hated to see me die. Who would he hang out with then? And nobody else would believe his story about seeing what we now had to do through Bigfoot. He managed to help me get into bed, and I stayed there for a couple of days, telling my folks I had the flu. My stomach was sore for days. I felt bad lying to my mom, and, as she thought it was from being sick, and brought me all kinds of soup and stuff. I had nightmares for years, as did Ralphie. The experience kept us together, as nobody on earth would believe us except each other, and we're still close friends after all these years, even though Ralphie now lives 500 miles away. I still live in Steamboat. The county went out and demolished the town of Mount Harris years ago, sealing up the old coal mine after they had to rescue a young guy who got stuck in there. So Mount Harris is now just a spot where the timber isn't quite as tall. The trees growing were once Ralphie and I had watched a Bigfoot family. I don't know what became of the Bigfoot, and I don't really want to know. I still have no idea how close we came to being caught or what they would have done to us. I suspected they could have easily caught us and didn't want to. From other stories I've since heard and read, I think they were just trying to scare us off. And I'm convinced that I was the recipient of a gift of infrasound with that punch in the stomach. Sometimes at night, I hike up Howlston Hill, the site of the old ski jumps, and look at the stars there above the town. That's about as far out as I'm going to go, knowing what's out there. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!